Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This 22-year-old patient's teeth have been scaled and the occlusion has been adjusted. He has also received instruction in oral hygiene. Several deep intrabony periodontal pockets are present. The mesial pocket on the left maxillary incisor is 8 millimeters deep on the labial aspect and 9 millimeters on the palatal aspect. There is minimal bone loss on the right central incisor, but extensive bone loss at the mesial aspect of the left central incisor. After the surgical field has been anesthetized, iodine lotion is applied to reduce the number of bacterial flora in the area. The initial incision is started in the gingival crevice on the labial aspect of tooth number nine. The blade is angled about 20 to 30 degrees to the tooth and the incision carried down to the alveolar process through the interproximal area to the labial surface of tooth number eight. A similar incision is made on the palatal side. It is also carried down to bone. The interproximal soft tissues are separated from the bone and the teeth with a sharp curette. And remove from the palatal side. The bony surface of the defect is thoroughly curetted. The adjacent root surface bordering the defect is planed. The bottom of the defect has three bony walls, while the coronal part has only one. The cortical lining of the bony defect is penetrated in several places with a number one round burr. Superficial vertical incisions are made through the gingival mucosa over the two central incisors. The incisions extend into the alveolar mucosa. The two vertical incisions are then connected with a superficial horizontal incision. A Bard Parker number 11 blade and a pair of small tissue forceps are used to separate a split thickness flap of mucosa from the periosteum. Notice the attempt to leave a buccal connective tissue wall bordering the defect. The surface of the exposed connective tissue is trimmed with a pair of surgical scissors to assure close contact between this bed and the future graft. Residual epithelium is also removed.
a similar mucosal flap is removed on the palatal side. Orban knives and a tissue forcept are used. The defect is now inspected. Note the residual labial and palatal soft tissue walls giving the entire defect a three wall appearance, although only the apical part actually has three bony walls. A template of tinfoil has been prepared to fit the recipient site of the future graft. Osteoplasty is required to correct a large one bony wall defect on the distal aspect of tooth number four. This will be used as a donor site for a bone graft. An incision is made to expose the bony defect. The incision is carried down to bone and sloped palatally to create a full thickness flap. The soft tissue is raised with a mucoperiosteal elevator. In order to gain adequate access to the bony defect, the flap is retracted with a suture. Gauze soaked in sterile saline is placed over the recipient site of the bone graft. Surface cortical bone is then removed with a trefine burr. The cancellous bone and marrow are removed with a ronger and placed in a spoon excavator. The fragments are transferred directly to the recipient site and packed into the bony defect. Both the bony and the soft tissue walled parts of the defect are filled with the fragments of bone. The recipient site is again covered with gauze moistened in sterile saline while a soft tissue graft is prepared. The flap covering the donor site has been sutured in place. A template for the soft tissue graft is placed in the palate and a shallow mucosal incision is made. Approximately one and a half millimeters thickness of mucosal tissue is dissected free. The graft is placed on a gauze sponge moistened in sterile saline and the connective tissue surface is trimmed smooth with surgical scissors. The graft has been placed over the recipient site and sutured into position with 5-0 silk sutures. The palatal aspect of the graft is also sutured into place. A sponge moistened in sterile saline is placed over the graft and mild pressure is applied for two to three minutes. This will establish good contact between the graft and the recipient site. Three percent acromycin ointment is then applied over the sutures. Adhesive tinfoil is placed over the graft.
post-surgical dressing is applied and adapted around the adjacent teeth. Dressing has been used to cover the other sites of surgery, both on the buccal and palatal surfaces. One week post-operatively, the dressing is removed and the teeth are cleaned with a curette. The sutures are also removed. The site of the surgery is sponged with 1.5% hydrogen peroxide solution. The area is then rinsed with lukewarm water. Note the close adaptation of the graft to the tooth with the intrabony lesion. A second dressing is then placed. At the end of two weeks, healing appears to be progressing satisfactorily. Some debris covers the graft site. The teeth are cleaned with a curette. The area is swabbed with 1.5% hydrogen peroxide solution. Rinsing with water, the teeth are polished. The grafted tissues are edematous, and there has been some gingival recession. The grafted palatal tissues are also edematous, but appear to be closely adapted to the teeth. There has been a two millimeter recession of the labial gingiva. The residual mesial labial pocket is three millimeters deep and probing does not evoke bleeding. There has been slight gingival recession on the palatal aspect and the residual mesial palatal pocket now measures four millimeters from the cemento enamel junction. Three millimeters of attachment has been gained from this procedure. Comparison of pre-operative and post-operative rentgenograms reveals significant reduction of the original osseous defect. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.